Alejandro Jodorowsky is a radically bold and outrageous filmmaker, whose work is incredibly spiritual, and on the surface it can seem esoteric. But in reality, his unique filmic style is informed by a lifelong study in tarot, Eastern mysticism, and Jungian philosophy. His visual approach combines vibrant religious iconography with grotesque and often sexually violent imagery. His cinematography is both meticulous and surreal, and loaded with intense symbolic gravity, where objects and movements are turned into metaphors, emphasizing their concepts and ideas over the literal plot points of the film. Watching any of his nine films is a very dreamlike experience, a pageant for the eyes, but a meditation for the soul. And they all feel like they kind of exist in the same universe, this strange circus-like reality where everything is exaggerated and hyper-coordinated. It's a feeling I sometimes get when I watch Kubrick or Lynch or even Wes Anderson. It's the meticulous calculation and attention paid to the spatial arrangement of objects. It invokes the feeling of an omnipresent designer, a sort of all-seeing eye. But I think Jodorowsky's universe, on an optical level, soars above these other painterly directors. Visually, his films go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Wes Anderson's, matching his mastery of color and shot composition. But Jodorowsky's visions actually have true symbolic meaning. They have a spiritual seriousness to them, as if they're imploring the viewer to transcend to some higher plane of existence. The man himself is something of a mystic, a self-titled psycho-magician. His parents were circus performers, and elements of his highly unusual upbringing often appear in his films. As well as his love of the occult, Jungian philosophy, tarot, and Eastern mysticism. In this video, I'll be taking a quick look at each of his films in the order that he made them, inspecting how they were made, and what they might possibly mean, while also delving into some of Jodorowsky's more hilarious eccentricities as a person. I'll also be covering his cultural legacy, and the many artists who've ripped him off over the years. So let's see if we can begin to unearth some of the mysteries behind one of cinema's boldest and most out there voices, and one of my all time favorites. Have you ever heard about Jodorowsky, the director? I am the father of the Midnight Movies. Jodorowsky was born in Chile in 1929, whereas I'm sure you won't be surprised he worked as a mime. But he was really good, and at the young age of 18, he founded his own theater company. He wrote his own plays, and his troupe performed across the country of Chile. And even in these extremely early stage productions, you can begin to see his distinctive visual language taking shape. But by now, Jodorowsky's ambitions were too big to stay in his home country. So he headed to Paris, where he studied mime under famed instructor and performer Marcel Marceau. And he got involved with the Surrealists. This is the first time Jodorowsky took an interest in filmmaking. In 1953, the 24-year-old adapted a French novella into a mime film titled La Crevette, or The Severed Heads. Starring Jodorowsky himself, the film was considered lost until 2006 when a new print of the film was discovered. The film is mostly silent, and immediately you can see many of Jodorowsky's common filmic techniques being used, such as integrating mime and theater into film, conservative and often stationary camera work, a bold use of makeup, and garish, colorful costumes and set dressing. It, also like all of his work, is dreamlike and full of magical realism. And also, the film stars a Jodorowsky. This would begin a lifelong tradition of Alejandro casting his sons in his movies. Pretty much every single one. So chances are, if it looks like a Jodorowsky, or acts weird like a Jodorowsky, it's a Jodorowsky. Okay, so moving right along. By now it was 1960, and Alejandro was done dicking around in Paris. And he had some wanderlust, so he moved to Mexico City where he would eventually direct over 100 plays. He started something called the Panic Movement, which was essentially experimental, chaotic theater. He expanded on the ideas of surrealist Antonin Artoux, whose signature theater of cruelty theories were instrumental in shaping Jodorowsky's artistic perspective, that being of magic, myth, and ritual. But Jodorowsky's productions were far more raw, and they would often devolve into absurd sexual savagery. And so he began making a name for himself as a controversial provocateur in both Mexico and Paris, a reputation he would maintain throughout his life. 
And it was from this philosophical standpoint that Jodorowsky began piecing together his first feature-length film, Fondo Elise. que en la doné una bulibre más de sortir de teatro que es el telefestival de Acapulco una finitud de la mierda en la oscuridad y es sortir de cuché en el fondo de Inguatil para que bulé me lanche ya me ocupé si ya no hay el espectador que el espectador si la ve de ritmo si la ve pa de ritmo tú se recherche técnica que os fue plitar no es pa no hay en el pa para ser el espectador y yo le fe de trip como saben Based on the play by his friend Fernando Arabal, Fando Elis tells the story of a young couple who are searching for the mythical city of Tar and the misadventures they experience along the way. The film is set in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, and it features Jodorowsky's signature dreamlike surrealism. It also features many elements of the panic movement. It contains scenes of sexual and manic violence. And he wasn't exaggerating about the crowd reaction. When the film premiered in 1968, a full-scale riot broke out. Ultimately, the film wasn't received with very high praise, with many critics dismissing it as a lesser version of Fellini's Satyricon, which came out two years later. Yeah, that's a film for a different time. Anyways, after the controversial release of Fando Elise, Jodorowsky met Zen Buddhist master Eho Takada, and Alejandro became a kind of spiritual disciple of his, spreading the gospel of transcendental meditation and Zen Buddhism. This influence would be seen in all of his subsequent work. And it was in his next film that we would see the confluence of all the phases of his life up until that point. From mime, to panic, to Zen. And this is why many consider it to be his finest work. picture without violence. Terrible scene, beautiful scene go together. When I showed the blood in, in El Topo, I was showing the force of life. They tried to sell the film to MGM and Universal, but both studios shot him down. They said they didn't know how to market such a film. Can you imagine? It was seen as too sexually subversive. But nevertheless, the film quickly found a hungry cult audience amongst the emerging hippie demographic. And it's easy to see why. It was a spiritual journey with this raw power and sort of rough ritualistic side that and it was very fresh to me and haunted my dreams for a long time. Often described as an acid western, El Topo shares a reputation with David Lynch's Eraserhead as being the first midnight movie. Be prepared to live the most wonderful experience of your life. El Topo is not a western. It goes far beyond any western. El Topo is not a religious film. It contains all religions. The story is basically a spaghetti-style Western take on Sodom and Gomorrah. It's set in this deeply bourgeois town, where cultish puritanical beliefs mask an undercurrent of socially sanctioned racism, colonialism, debauchery, violence. This is the film that basically put Jodorowsky on the map in the American art scene. And it was his first to receive critical acclaim.
Among the people it impressed were these guys. John Lennon loved the picture, and he saw his picture in the Elgin Theater, and then he said, now you will see an extraordinary picture. He showed the picture at midnight, and for a year, when I was lucky. I was visiting with John Lennon there, taking coffee. He was smoking a big cigar of marijuana. So he wants to make a film, and no, they go to a company and they get shown into the waste paper bin. <laughs> and uh, nothing ever happens, so they go around, they make an underground one, and it goes round and round underground, and a lot of people never see it. Right. So if they come to us, they won't stand a chance. Which is basically what happened. John Lennon, through his then-manager Alan Klein, agreed to finance Jodorowsky's next film whatever it was going to be. Carte Blanche Baby. And this is exciting, because it brings us to my favorite of his films. In the top, I was telling an history in my way, but I was to tell an history. The Holy Mountain, I want to do an experience to change all the way to make movies, not to tell an history, to make a picture who can, who can open the mind of the, the person who sees that. If you haven't seen it, go watch this movie. The plot, if you can call it one, is basically about a group of people who forsake their possessions to follow a spiritual guru, played of course by Jodorowsky, on a vision quest for ultimate enlightenment. The main character is the archetype of the thief, who eventually becomes a kind of redeemed Christ-like figure. He ultimately becomes the spiritual guru's apprentice. We see again Jodorowsky's visual mastery of color and costume, but ultimately we're following the guru up a mountain, the Holy Mountain, on Lotus Island, where they will receive the secrets of the universe from a group of immortals. But many outrageous things go down along the way. Your against the mountain. Yeah, it gets kind of weird. You've never seen anything like it. Magicien, mais aussi j'ai joué les voleurs, parce que les voleurs à ma voix. Yes. Les voleurs représentent l'ego, magicien c'est l'essence, l'être essentiel. L'être essentiel au commandement c'est comme un con de fait. Et peu à peu, à fur et à mesure que, que, que les films avancent, tu n'es caméra dans la main avec aucun moyen pour arriver à la vérité. He's talking about the way the film ends, where Jodorowsky's character breaks the fourth wall, addressing both the audience and the camera crew, and going on a Kanye esque rant about living in the moment. Dice fin, zumba camera. We are images, dreams, photographs. We must not stay here, prisoners. We shall break the illusion. This is Maya. to the holy mountain. Real life awaits us. I've just never seen a film that does that, that creates such an immersive, unusual world, and then ultimately exposes the creation of that very world as a construction. It doesn't feel like watching a regular movie. It feels like you yourself are going on a spiritual vision quest. It requires your participation, for you to examine your own interiority. It's a movie that kind of gets tattooed onto your brain. Critically, the film did not do as well as El Topo when it premiered at the Cannes Film Festival in 1973. Alan Klein was done funding him, and went so far out of his way to ruin Jodorowsky's career 
that he revoked both El Topo and the Holy Mountain from circulation for decades, hoping to prevent their official release until after Jodorowsky's death. Dick. But this was not the end for Jodorowsky. He would go on to begin his most ambitious project to date. But he actually wasn't able to finish this film, and there's this really good documentary about this whole project called Jodorowsky's Dune. And if you want to know more about this phase in Jodorowsky's career, I highly suggest you watch this film. As the documentary details, the Hollywood producers backed out of the project when Jodorowsky's budget got out of hand. And Pink Floyd, who were set to do the soundtrack, weren't being cooperative either. So, the film never got made, with David Lynch making his subpar version a decade later, depending on who you ask. So after these defeats, Jodorowsky had another bout of wanderlust. So he traveled to India and made a film called Tusk. No, not that one. It's not very high quality, and it doesn't really feature any of Jodorowsky's trademark aesthetic, so it's not really worth getting deep into. And there's not much known about this period of his life. Although it does feature some Hindu and Buddhist iconography, and some interesting costume design. Ultimately, it's kind of an obscure footnote of his career. By now, it was the late 80s, and Jodorowsky was well into his middle age. And over the years, people began to go back and reevaluate his older works. His next film would be somewhat autobiographical. And of course, it stars his family. When I wanted to do uh, Santa Sangre, uh, I need to wait six years. And that was so they could raise enough money to give Jodorowsky total artistic freedom. Yeah, it's a great movie. And out of all of Jodorowsky's, it has the most cohesive plot. The story plays out like a Latin American version of Psycho. And it has all the Jodorowskyan elements that you want. From carnival romps, to elaborate and lavish set design, and of course, plenty of callbacks to his years in the circus. There's even elements of the panic movement. Uh, there's also this guy. The story follows Fenix, played by Axel Jodorowsky, who we meet in a mental asylum. Through flashbacks, we learn of his first love, and the many traumatic experiences in his youth that led him to his insanity. The film features an ensemble of sordid characters, who all play a role in shaping Fenix's warped reality in one way or another. Subject-wise, it's incredibly heavy, but because it's photographed so beautifully, it can be easy to forget. If you were going to introduce a friend of yours to the films of Jodorowsky, I would definitely start with this one. It's like a visually gorgeous carnival nightmare. Released in 1989, Santa Sangre was received much more positively than his last several films, and returned Jodorowsky to the cultural conversation. With some critics directly comparing he and Lynch, who was also at the top of his game in 1989. And it does kind of feel like a David Lynch film at times. Santa Sangre is right up there with the Holy Mountain in my book. And I always debate which one is a better watch. But really, they're nothing alike, and I highly suggest you watch this film. So I'm just going to briefly mention his 1999 film The Rainbow Thief, starring Christopher Lee. 
The project was one of Alejandro's few director-for-hire gigs, although it does still have a fair smattering of his trademark cinematic devices. This film also stars Peter O'Toole and Omar Sharif, who together with Christopher Lee, are the biggest name actors Jodorowsky had ever worked with. It's pretty silly, and it's the funniest of Jodorowsky's films. So, we're almost at the end here, with only two more films to go. But before we wrap up, I want to briefly mention this guy. Kanye West has often cited Jodorowsky as one of his influences, and there's a hilarious story about the two of them meeting. You recently met with Kanye West. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh, your impression? Was very surrealistic. I didn't knew nothing about Kanye West. <laughs> but really, I don't know who he is. Now. The only thing they say, a rapper, a person who sings rap, they say to me, speak, you are a genius, and he inspired you, him to make a show with Apex Jesus, and he's inspired by the Holy Mountain. Fantastic. He was there with four more guys. He was, he, he was with the director. What is his name? Huh? Spike Young. What I said, I, what do you want? I, immediately I like it, him. I, I, I feel a communication. And the other guy, I don't know why was it, they was there. <laughs> and then I said, well, if you want, my like friend, I, I will give you an idea. I will not repeat because maybe he will use that. You do that, <laughs> he liked the idea. I made the gift an idea. Then there's this guy, director Nicholas Winding Refn, who's responsible for Drive and the Pusher films. He often credits Jodorowsky as being both his primary cinematic influence and his spiritual advisor. It always leads back to Jodorowsky. You can see Jodorowsky's influence all over his work. And let's not forget about this guy. Mr. Jodorowsky, see, you know I am Marilyn Manson. You are crazy or what? No, I am Marilyn Manson. I, I, I love the, the Holy Mountain. I want you to direct the picture with me. <laughs> so you get the point. His impact is deep reaching in our culture, whether we know it or not. In the 2000s, he tried and failed to make a sequel to El Topo. But his next two films would be deeply autobiographical. It's filmed in the Chilean uh, town village that, in which he grew up. Both The Dance of Reality and Endless Poetry were received with high praise. And I just think it's so cool that a man in his 90s is still producing some of the strongest work of his career. What is the goal of art? I mean, he premiered Dance of Reality fully naked. Yeah, I cropped that for you. You're welcome. Anyways, Jodorowsky is one of the most prolific artists I've ever covered. I didn't even mention his comic book career. And he doesn't engage in the kind of intellectualism that I do on this channel. Can we talk about your return to filmmaking with Dance of Reality and how it not only comments on, but uh, also augments everything that you've done before? What's the question? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's not the way to engage with Jodorowsky. Every second of this picture, I am giving my blood. I am giving my life. The passage can be changed. This is what is important. Making the cost, making the colors, giving color to a life who was gray from the beginning. Was the picture important for me? Yes, important. Change myself. Every one of us suffered. 
Every one of us. Every one of us will die. Every one of us. Every one wants to find himself a peace, a happiness. If I die tomorrow, it's my last will. But if I continue, it's my comeback. I will make, I will make picture till I die. Ah, I hope that's the case. Well, I hope you learned something, and even if you knew about Yodorowsky, I still hope you learned something. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, I recently left my job so that I can do this full time, so please support me there. Uh, that way we can get these videos coming out a lot quicker. Uh, thanks you guys, and uh, catch you next time!